So why did I even decide to watch this show? What the fuck? Well now you know. This guy works on some of the most random shit ever, and since he was the director of both the original FMA and Shaman King, I now have a legal obligation to cover the show on my channel. Though, by that logic, I also have to make a video about fucking Blaze Blue and Hula Fula Dance, but... That's besides the point. D4DJ is actually a pretty good show about the formation of Wouldn't You Guess It, a DJ group, and their goal of making it to performing on the big stage. Now, the first thing that'll catch the eyes of most anime fans is the fact that this is CGI, but it's actually good CGI, like just look at it. Between X-Arm and Trigun Stampede, this would definitely be closer to the latter. The movements of the characters are very fluid, the designs of the main characters at least are great, and sometimes I have a hard time even figuring out whether what I'm seeing is even 3D. And since this is a show about DJs, you can also expect some really great music from it. The stage shows all look and sound great and not just in an artificially impressive way. Watching these performances, it's like I'm physically standing there in the concert hall, feeling every bit of excitement that the crowd does. But even outside of that, the soundtrack is definitely the standout component on the technical side of things. The OST generally has this funky and continuous flow to it, much like the episodes of the show themselves. During the good episodes, at least, this show just has a certain rhythm to it, hitting the right plot beats at the right time. It's at its best when every scene feels like it's pushing along the narrative of the episode. Things like Rinku starting off aimless at the beginning and hearing a certain song playing and the loudspeakers sending her on a direct collision course with Maho, Mooney being hesitant to speak with Rinku due to their childhood friendship, only for the next scene to bring them together anyway in a funny coincidence, or Rei deciding to teach Rinku how to play the piano and then being immediately integrated into the cast after meeting the other two. One of the best aspects of the show is that it isn't really about the idol slash DJ side of things. That general premise in most of these episodes is more so used as an excuse for setting up things related to character building or developing the relationships between the four girls who make up the main cast, whether that be through slice of life shenanigans or surprisingly compelling drama. And it's in those relationships that the strengths of this anime truly lie, and I think that's because of just how naturalistic the process of these characters growing closer together is. Like in episode 2, when the show subtly portrays Maho getting used to Rinku's eccentric and kind of overbearing personality purely through her reactions alone. She goes from pushing her away defensively to nudging her gently when she gets too close, and later on when Rinku gets up all in her personal space, she does seem uncomfortable, but she doesn't quite reject her in the same way she did at the beginning of the episode. Then, after their first performance, she even plays along with and reciprocates reciprocates the movements Rinku makes during their celebration, indicating her embrace of our excitable, perky, and kind of annoying protagonist. You can see this in all of the characters and the way they gradually change how they interact with each other. Mooney goes from really timidly contributing to conversations to this attention-seeking goblin who's always looking for a chance to assert her opinions on something. Rei starts off as a reserved and proper girl, but after hanging out with Mooney and eating authentic curry, she no longer feels the need to hide the weirder facets of her personality caused by her sheltered upbringing. It really feels like the characters are organically opening up and getting used to each other's little quirks over time. The exception to this being Rinku, she stays pretty much the same throughout the show's run and her role in the story is more to inspire change in others rather than herself. However, the show manages to mark her friendship with the others as significant still. At the start, she makes a pretty bad first impression on her classmates, resulting in her eating alone on her first day of school. The point of the scene is simple, but it creates a framework for the rest of the show as you watch the empty space around her slowly fill up. The heart of the show comes from these budding relationships, which the show places emphasis on using a simple but effective seashell motif throughout. It's through these bonds they forge that these characters are able to pursue their dreams, get over their past trauma, and make their lives more fulfilling by dedicating themselves to something they're genuinely passionate about. So on top of being just fun and charming, the slice of life elements of the show actually have a greater purpose since this is about the great place these characters have found themselves in relative to where they were at the start of the show. But even without that, these characters are just so fun. The different characteristics they all bring to the table definitely fall into tropes, but they don't stick to a single routine all the time. For instance, Maho is set up to be the straight man at first, and given her personality, she definitely seems like the most normal of the cast, which makes her the most fitting for that role. And she does it really well. The faces she makes in reaction to certain things the others do are all so good, but she also has her own passions that sometimes overrides her purely reactionary role in the comedy. Like when she loses her shit over Ray having some deluxe lunchbox from some top tier store. In this episode, she becomes so enamored with the idea of fine dining that Mooney of all people takes a step back and becomes the most normal person reacting to her and Rinku's bullshit. And Ray starts off as yet another straight man, but her sheltered life up until now gives her this hilariously oblivious energy which unintentionally causes problems for the others. The main cast in comedy is so memorable that I almost got distracted from the fact that this is not a purely positive review. Unfortunately, this is where I have to start criticizing D4DJ. Episode 7 and onward focus more on the other DJ groups walking around the school, which is a huge distraction from what episodes 1 through 6 focus on solely. It would be one thing if these other groups were entertaining at all, but they're not. Peaky Peaky and Photon Maiden were both in the first half of the show, but they were much less intrusive, only really 
like serving minor roles in bolstering the plots related to the main group, as opposed to having their own war. Peaky Peaky mainly served as a way of inspiring and getting Rinku invested in DJing, and Photon Maiden's only purpose was to give the writers an excuse to integrate Rei into the main group. We don't need any of these bloated, long-winded flashbacks about how freaking Peaky Peaky started out, or any of the shit about Photon Maiden's strict but secretly kind manager. In the latter half of the show, these two groups just get in the way of other and more interesting stuff. They're also just really anime, and they take themselves way too seriously. They talk like fucking shonen characters. It's horrendous. Guys, you're DJs, get over yourselves. That's not to say the second half is completely devoid of the strengths present within the first half of the show, though. Episodes 7 and 8, for example, play with the fear of these bonds ending, with Rinku potentially leaving Happy around, and while it's obvious that's not going to happen, it is nice to see the resolution of this conflict when it all turns out that the thought never even crossed Rinku's mind. I just wish we didn't need to have a scene of Maho talking with the pink bitch in the middle of the episode. It's all fun and games until a minor-ass character starts drifting off into a flashback for four minutes when I don't give a fuck about this girl, and I'm just waiting for the resolution of the episode to happen. And while Photon Maiden is nowhere near as cringe as Peaky Peaky, they're honestly just as bad, if not worse, in terms of just how much time they suck up and turn into a black hole completely void of love, compassion, or any kind of empathy at all. They get their own fucking episode, for Christ's sake. Peaky Peaky's never been this intrusive, although at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because they both suck really bad. The second half of the show ends on an incredibly strong note, though, and it's all thanks to Mooney, the undisputed best character in the show, and episode 12 is undeniably the best episode of the show, centered around repairing the damaged relationships between Mooney and Rinku. Every scene in this episode, with the exception of one small cameo from Peaky Peaky, I really wish they didn't exist, has so much purpose and focus behind it. Case in point, the opening scene. While it works well at establishing the basic premise through a phone call between Rinku and Mooney, it also subtly clues you in on what's going on emotionally with the characters. When Mooney finds out that Rinku tried calling both Maho and Rei before her, she shows signs of jealousy because Rinku seems to prioritize the other two over her. She shows discomfort over the thought that the other two seem to be closer with Rinku than she is. She's butthurt over the fact that Maho is close enough with Rinku to instantly accept her idea of incorporating rap into their performances. She gets mad when Rinku wants to go to Maho's house instead of hers, and she gets frustrated when Rinku ignores her to talk to another one of her friends on the phone. Just back to back to back, this episode constantly prods at Mooney until she reaches her breaking point, this being literally represented by Mooney struggling to fend off a strong enemy in a game. There's a psychology to all of Mooney's actions, and the way it's shown to us, it's honestly scary just how relatable it all is. Even if it turns out to be unfounded, the feeling of being left out of a friend group fucking sucks. I can very easily sympathize with being moody over something like that and letting this idea that you're not wanted fester in your mind. And the way the argument happens and comes to an end just feels so natural. The dialogue exchanges between the two are minimal and neither character says more than they feel they need to. The way the scene played out, it felt like I was watching a fight that me and my brother have sometimes, right down to the awkward way Rinku leaves hoping the next day the problem would be solved. The most beautiful part of the scene has to do with the track playing in the background, however. It's the same track that plays in an earlier scene when Rinku and Muni are having a sleepover, except in that scene it sounded floaty and dreamlike. <laughs> whereas here it comes off as much more somber, of course, but also simplified. I think that's really cool, since these two scenes are both a part of every relationship, and just because you get into a fight doesn't mean the nature of that relationship necessarily changes. You're just not looking at this in the best light right now. That sleepover scene is just so cute, too. There's this powerful nostalgic feel to the music as Mooney unconsciously reminisces about the time they spent together as children, and the way she tries to distance herself from Rinku while still very clearly wanting to be closer to her is indicative of her uncomfortability with acting like nothing's changed between them. When it's revealed that the conflict revolves around how Mooney failed to keep her promise and write Rinku letters every day when she moved away, her actions are also recontextualized and given a new meaning on top of the one you can see on a first watch through. It's not just a matter of her being jealous that Rinku seems closer to her other friends, it might also have to do with some annoyance over the idea that this was her fault somehow. The way they drifted apart and she lost that special connection with her closest friend over something she had caused is tragic. It's surprising just how well thought out the details surrounding the two's history with each other are. Innocuous things earlier on in the show, like Rinku's dedication to keeping her promise with Mooney in episode 3 and her mentioning of the fact that the two of them used to be pen pals before are suddenly huge deals. The hesitance Mooney shows before deciding to go to Rinku's first performance in episode 2 is so much sadder knowing the context. Just imagine the regret Mooney must have felt during all of this and how cathartic it must have been for her to finally apologize to Rinku at the end of episode 12. This episode just hits you out of nowhere and presents this very real and poignant story about fully mending a broken bond, and it legitimately almost made me cry. It's the kind of climax that's perfectly fitting for a show about the importance of connections. And then episode 13 happens and it was 
was all right. It's not a bad finish to the show, I just think it's kind of anticlimactic, especially in comparison to what came before it. There's one scene that I really like, which is this moment of all the characters looking at the various shells on display in Rinku's room and recounting their experiences of receiving some from her. It's a nice little reflective moment for all of them. You could probably take this one scene and put it at the end of episode 12, and that would have been the perfect finale for me. Yes, some things would have been left unresolved, like their performances on the sunset stage, but I don't really care. That's not what I'm watching the show for. So overall impressions, D4DJ is overall a good show, but in the second half it starts getting lost in the sauce and mixing up its priorities by placing emphasis on groups that don't matter at all. However, it's fun more often than not and actually has some great character writing in it. I'd love it if there was some kind of second season, but there isn't one, at least not one that I'd like to acknowledge.